This meeting is being recorded. <laughs> got it. Got it. Yeah, got it. Yeah, I got it. So share screen, huh? Oh, yeah, I did share the screen. If people would please mute yourselves, I will if you don't. But it's nice if you do it yourself. I'm going so I don't to share really... <laughs> Dana. Is that oh, showing? I... Yes. I love that plant. Is that the lady slipper? No, that's a steer's head. Oh, yeah. Lady course, slipper is lady slipper. Lady slipper or calypso slipper is in here. Well, thank you. <clears throat> Thanks to everybody for showing up. Uh, and uh, so this particular slideshow, I <clears throat> I showed before, <clears throat> actually, on a Zoom at Met How at Home, I think two years ago. And, uh, and I just thought I would comment on that. And that, the comment is that, you know, repetition is not 100% repetition. And actually, I have to, I have to come up with what to say, and it can't be possibly say the same thing I said two years ago, although I have the same notes here, but I don't tend to look at the notes. I read them two or three times and just awkward trying to look at notes. <clears throat> I guess the thing is reminders don't hurt and repetition. I mean, when I looked at this, I had to remind myself, I put this together, of course, <clears throat> I had to remind myself what the storyline was. And I appreciate that about doing these programs. I'm relearn and I'm reminded and uh, about the marvelous quality of the natural world. And certainly as uh, illustrated by this flower, which is called Sears Head. Excuse me, Dana, do you want to do the slideshow? Yeah. There you go. Thank you. So we're, we're talking about the flora of the Met How. Uh, you know, our mind, minds don't tend to dwell so much on the natural world. That's one thing that strikes me as I <clears throat> go through this program and I look at the notes and I try to remember what the information is and, and am astonished and re-astonished by the natural world. Um, it is infinitely astonishing and amazing and even miraculous and surprising how little uh, impression it makes on us over time. Now, granted, we're buried in snow right now and most of these things are not particularly visible. I can look out the window and see ponderosa pines and a cottonwood or two. The cottonwoods still have their leaves on them, interestingly enough. I'm not all their leaves, but a lot of leaves. Something about the way the fall progressed, I think, <clears throat> It was so dry in the fall that the leaves never uh, fell off the trees. But this is a big world. Uh, in fact, plants make up probably 90% of the weight of the biosphere. This comes up several times in the slideshow, and I think I mentioned it last week, but <clears throat> because plants are able to turn carbon dioxide and water into sugar through photosynthesis, they are the autotrophs, that means self-feeding. They make their own food. We are heterotrophs, other feeding. We don't make our own food. It, if it weren't for the autotrophs, we would not exist. And so the autotrophs are the dominant organisms on the planet and make up, I'm actually, I'm not sure if you remember that I showed that uh, graph or chart last week of biomass, but it's Certainly 80% of the mass of life on the planet are photosynthetic organisms, mostly plants, and most of those are trees. So it, it's a big world, and it's not one that, you know, human concerns tend to be with our own life. I'm just fascinated by how uh, dominating our personal concerns to, can be and how they block out this, this infinitely complex natural world around us. And I think uh, a good journey is becoming more aware of the natural world <laughs> and less uh, focused on the individual. <clears throat> so this is a plant called steer's head. It's one of, uh, I think I think there's uh, approximately 1,100 flowering plants in the Medhow. And that's relevant to me in the sense I mentioned last week or the week before, the Medhow could be considered uh, 
an evolutionary laboratory or a microcosm of the whole world because the whole evolutionary story of life is very much present in the Meha Valley. And I think all of these, most of these pictures are from the Meha Valley, but they tell the evolutionary story of life. So the two are going together, the story of, in this case, the plant kingdom in the Medhau, but also the evolution of the plant kingdom and life on the planet. It's all right here for us to study. So what a strange plant. Why does this plant exist? Well, flowers, showy flowers only exist because they're in a symbiotic relationship with another life form, most often an insect. And as often as not, could be 50% of the time, a bumblebee. Bumblebees are the all-time great pollinators on the planet. And what I know about this plant, I well, two things. One is this plant is hard to find. And many of you, if you live here, can confirm that. I found one on Signal Hill. If you remember where Signal Hill is, Twin Winthrop and Twisp, when I lived there for a winter and a spring, apparently, walking up through the bitterbrush, I found one, the first one I'd ever seen after being here for many years. And I thought it must be the rarest plant in the Medhow. <clears throat> and George Wooten pointed out that it's not that uncommon. And now I sort of know where to find it. And it, uh, actually a recommendation, if you want to see it, is to go to that hike on Virginia Ridge, where you go to the bombed out parking lot and hike down the ridge in the middle of May. Because this plant is really only active in May. By June 1st, it dries up and blows away and you can't even find the leaves. It's just gone. But there are a number of plants here you have to be watching for. It. So this is co-evolved with animals, with bumblebees. And just briefly, because I've already had this picture up for a while, what could, the, what, could, what could the strategy be and why did this evolve? Well, the strategy is to reproduce as efficiently as possible. And so this is a bilateral flower, which is very selective, very selective about what organisms can obtain its pollen. Bumblebees are the probably the most dependable pollinators because they work one species at a time. If a bumblebee comes to this flower, it'll go to another steer's head and another steer's head. If it went to another kind of flower, it would waste the pollen. It lands on that face. This snout, <clears throat> I think the nectaries are here. If you can see my cursor. I don't know if you can, probably you can. In any case, the top of the head are nectaries. So the insect is going to stick its tongue in here. Meanwhile, the body is going to be here. The snout splits apart. This, this is not um, sealed here. It splits apart and both the anther, anthers, which deliver the pollen, and the pistil, which collects the pollen, poke out. The snout splits apart and the anthers poke out and they hit the bumblebee on the belly and deliver the pollen to the belly of the bumblebee. The pistil's there too, so that when it goes to the next flower, the pistil will pick up that pollen from another plant, another steer's head. So that's what this flower is about. And it has, it has this is an, a, a highly efficient method of pollination because a bumblebee will only go to steer's head at a certain time of day. And so the pollen is dependably delivered. So that's what this flower is up to. And uh, this complicated form has evolved over time. As we'll talk about, there are 300,000 species of flowers on the planet and they all have their own unique shape, shape and pollination strategy. There's a slight diversion here. I couldn't get off of this history of diatoms, but it relates because so the next picture is a diatom. But I got back to it because we are talking about flowering plants. Well, grasses are flowering plants. In fact, grasses grasses are recently evolved. Let me put that in quotes because we're on a very long time scale here. Grasses appeared <clears throat> something like 70 million years ago. Well, flowering plants are 120 million years old. So grasses are fairly newly evolved. Grasses are wind pollinated. They're flowering plants, but they're wind pollinated. They don't have attractive petals because they don't need to attract insects. They don't need to attract the wind that comes on its own. Grasses take, I talked about this. I just, as I say, I can't get over it. Grasses take up silica and create these little barbs on the leaves. You can cut yourself on a, a leaf of grass because of the these silica knives on the leaves. And that's, 
That's to prevent herbivores from eating grasses. Herbivores still eat grass. Both they've co-evolved, herbivores that have evolved east that have adjusted that. Anyhow, because of the ev evolution of grasses, more silica is taken up by this very widespread plant family. And then when the plant dies, the silica is in uh, solution, water solution, and it goes into the streams and it goes into the ocean. Diatoms are a form of algae. They're photosynthetic. They require silica for their shells. As, as silica increased in the ocean, diatom blooms decreased, increased in the ocean. These things, none of these things have existed forever. Life is on this enormous journey through time and is constantly changing over time. <clears throat> uh, to wax philosophical for a moment, if we are troubled about the human condition at this time, nothing stands still. Everything is emergent. And the possibilities for humans to continue to evolve and express our intelligence and stop the war in the Ukraine. <laughs> the crazy things that go on. They aren't they aren't built into the system forever. Everything changes. So that's a diatom bloom off the coast of Alaska. There were no diatoms at all until 100 million years ago. There were not very many diatoms 70 million years ago. In the last 20 million years, They've increased enormously in the cold portions of the ocean, in the north and the south. They're common in, in, off the coast of Antarctica. They're photosynthetic. They're creating, they're creating food using the energy of the sun, photosynthesis out of carbon dioxide, food that did not used to exist. So they are the base of a food chain, protus, <clears throat> and there are, then's going to be a whole world of plankton that live on these diatoms. And that led to the evolution of baleen whales. And that is a blue whale, which is a baleen whale. And it's the largest organism that has ever existed on the planet. And it arguably owes part of this, its existence to the evolution of grasses. I just think it's such a cool story. And this really is, I wanna give a nod. I did this before, a nod to big history. Big history is an academic subject. If you Google it and go to the Wikipedia page, you can spend a month <laughs> following the links there. Big history is evolution with some themes. One is the increase in complexity. It's li life, you know, life only appeared once, as far as we know. It, the evidence is one species, now there are, I looked it up and I cannot remember the estimate, uh, 8 million. 8 million total species on the planet. That is a very rough estimate. In any case, that's an example of how the universe, the planet has complexified over time. That is one of the themes of big history. It's a great subject. Parts of a flower, you this is just review. This will be on the test. Um, so this is a stereotypical flower. We, there, there are 300,000 species of flowers. They're all different. Probably none of them look like this, but they work on this theme. Even grasses work on this theme. They just don't have petals, but but grasses, which are wind pollinated, they still have an anthers and filaments, which are the parts of the stamen. They still have a female pistil that has the ovary at the base and the unfertilized eggs in the ovary, and then it has to receive the pollen. This is just a basic design. And then from there, it's almost infinite variation. And here's some example of variety of flowers. <clears throat> so many ways to be a flower on the planet. <clears throat> Thank you. So that lower right, that's a buttercup. <clears throat> Got more petals than our buttercup, but that's the way it goes. They're all different. There are many, many ranunculi, ranunculus. That's the genus of buttercups. Um, an anemone above the buttercup. We have anemones in the Midhouse Valley. Poppies uh, above that. Um, the moment I can't think of any native poppies in the Methow, but we plant them in our garden. Anyhow, just an example of how much variety there is. So this is a calendar, obviously, uh, of a year. If we were to try and shrink the evolutionary story onto a calendar, just for illustration purposes, and to get a sense of time and when things appeared on the planet, then every month would be... <clears throat> 400 million years. The planet is estimated 
to be 4.8 billion years. So I have a hard time remembering. So I just drew up a circle there in April. That is that that represents the appearance of life on the planet 3.8 billion years ago. The planet is 4.8 billion years. So an interesting point to contemplate is that for a, a quarter of the history of the planet, there was no life. It was barren of life. And life has enormously affected the planet since then. So let's see if I can remember these. Um, the appearance of life. Oh, that's photosynthesis. So for the first third of the history of life, the history of the planet photosynthesis had to be invented by life it, it had to it somehow in unknown ways figure out <clears throat> how to capture the energy of the sun in chemical bonds that's what fit, photosynthesis does it creates sugar and then other organic materials that become food for the rest of the biosphere so now i just pulled up uh december 1st and that is the appearance of land plants. So for most of the history of the planet, there were no plants on land. Um, really, there were no plants to speak of in the oceans. I think land plants appeared probably at the margins of wetlands, margin of the ocean, margin of freshwater wetlands, where they didn't have to worry about drying out. <clears throat> they had to evolve the ability to dry out later. So for most of the history of the planet, there were no plants, no plants at all. And then that's flowering plants. On December 21st, uh, that is most of the way through the history of the earth. So it's just interesting, all these things that we take for granted, they didn't used to exist. And they have evolved over time, and they are not done. Evolution is not done. It's a journey through time and space. And we get to be a part of it. This is a picture of Antarctica, McMurdo Sound in Antarctica. It's one of the warmer areas, so there's, at least in the summer, no snow and ice there. But this is what plant life looks like at McMurdo Sound, and it's just an example of the early, early Earth, before land plants evolved. Now, there are some land plants in this picture, but there's no shrubs. There's no, there's no flowering plants that we can see. Reading about the information that went with this slide when I pulled it off the internet, it said there's two, flower, two small flowering plants at McMurdo Sound. There's something like 200 species of moss and 100 species of liverworts, plants that are early evolved plants on the planet. They don't get very tall. They can't colonize dry areas, but they can at least colonize dry land or, or land, terrestrial surfaces. So this is sort of what the early colonization of land looked like. 400 million years ago. This is a famous picture of the Mehau 18,000 years ago. That is Mount Gart. And I, this is a reference to how much things over time, things change over time and how much plants have to adapt to a radically changing earth. So that's Mount Gardner on the left and Silver Star on the right. If you wonder how this picture was taken, it's, I'm just joking. Um, not really a picture of the Methow. It just looks like the Methow, but this is what the Methow looked like. Um, 18,000 years ago, 17, 16, 15, started to melt 14,000 years ago. This was not the only glacial advance. There were 17, 18. It's not known for sure. Uh, all, of the, all of the plant life, all of the organic life in the Methow was pushed out of the valley. And as you know, if you drive down towards Wenatchee, you can see the... Um, the moraines on the side of the hill and the ice went almost all the way to Wenatchee. And so the plants went all the way to Wenatchee and they had to return. How did they do it? Mm, there's supposed to be a, I thought there was a picture here. I guess it's in this one. This is the, the sisters in Oregon. And it shows what the, what the land mass looks like as the glaciers recede. So that glacier is just recently melted off. There's no plants. If you go up to where our glaciers are melting, uh, Silver Star Glacier, there's almost nothing there. It's fascinating to see. But life has to constantly move. We're worried about global warming, and I've heard of people even digging up plants and moving them, but plants have to move frequently 
because of the dynamics of the planet. So this is a very interesting book. After the Ice Age, the return of life to glaciated North America, this plant ecologist in Canada tells the story of how plants do that. But again, it's not something we commonly think of, but it's interesting to entertain that aspect of reality that plants live on a dynamic planet. And while they're rooted in place, they have to move periodically. So plants are the met how? Well, we have the whole suite of plants. We probably have, we have almost all plant divisions. I think sometimes hornworts. I've never seen a hornwort. And that's in part because there's no hornworts in the methal that I know of that anybody's ever seen. So that is a plant division and they'll, they'll show up here, not a well picture and a little chart. But we have plenty of lichens. So down at the bottom, it says 200 species of lichens. Who would think there are that many species of lichens in the methal valley? These are two crustose lichens. The upper two are crustose. They're just a crust on the rock. They must spend at least 10 months of the year dormant. Because can you imagine living on a dry rock in the Methow Valley or covered with three feet of snow, no liquid water and no sunlight penetrating the snow, and then the snow melts and everything's soaked in, in March and they photosynthesize, and then they dry out in April, and that's it until it rains. In, in. So lichens are impressive. Lichens are, interestingly enough, a symbiotic relationship between a fungi, a fungus and an algae or a bacteria, a cyanobacteria. So algae are by definition photosynthetic. Bacteria are not necessarily photosynthetic, but cyanobacteria are photosynthetic. Cyanobacteria are the originators of photosynthesis. You know, they're in their own um, kingdom. The, we talked about that bacteria are in their own kingdom, cyanobacteria. So they're early inventors on the planet. So these are symbiotic between a fungus and an algae or a cyanobacteria. Most of what we look at is our fungal threads, hyphae, same as they would be in a mushroom. Uh, and then if you break open even one of those little leafy structures, like you can see little leafy structures on the middle, the middle uh, jewel lichen, you can see a thin layer of green in there with your hand lens. You need to have a hand lens when you go out. And it's fascinating to see. Uh, and that is uh, that is the food source for the lichen. So the algae is feeding the lichen and the lichen is dissolving slowly, very slowly, uh, creating chemicals that will dissolve the minerals in the rock and feed nutrients to the algae. That's the symbiosis. The algae is photosynthetic. It's creating sugar out of the atmosphere mostly carbon dioxide. So these are tough organisms. There's a story that I encountered online that in one space, one, one trip into space happened to be a Russian trip in 2005. They took the first two lichens there, those two crustose lichens, map lichen and jewel lichen. They took them into space and then they got up there and they put them out for something like a week. They put them outside the space capsule for a week. So it was 250 degrees below zero and no protection from cosmic radiation, ultraviolet radiation from the sun and other cosmic rays, brought them back in, they were unharmed. Now they could not grow in space and they could not reproduce in space, but they are so tough that they were able to survive the abuses of space. So a good invention, it's worth, I mean, it, every time I re-entertain the thinking about photosynthesis, it never wears out for me, which is why I keep repeating it, but um, it's, it's, it's an astonishing phenomenon. So Lynn Margulis, very famous biologist, said it is the uh, single most important metabolic invention in the history of the planet. Most of the biomass on the planet is thanks to photosynthesis. We know the basics. Always astonishing if you think it through, but here is the product. Here is the all-time great product of photosynthesis, the largest living organism on the planet, single organism on the planet, the General Sherman tree. It is, uh, I think it's 6 million, let's see, maybe I put it in there, 6 million pounds. It's, it's, what's it made out of? It's made out of carbon dioxide and water, and it's not very much water. The hydrogen is broken. Hydrogen, you remember, hydrogen has almost no weight. It only has one proton, 
and one electron, and occasionally it has a neutron. So it really these, and then the hydrogen is attached to the carbon dioxide, and then you have the formula for sugar, mostly carbon dioxide. Transformed into sugar, the oxygen is released. We like to say it's, it's released as a waste product. Oxygen is not a waste product. It's, a, it's part of the cycle of energy on the planet. Without the oxygen, there would be almost no point in making the organic matter, which starts out as sugar, because it's oxygen that, that, that invades the sugar and breaks up those molecules and releases the energy of the sun that was captured in those chemical bonds. If it's fire, if it's burning, we call it fire. If we eat it, it's called digestion. <laughs> That's, but it's not a waste product. That's my point. So we can summarize by saying the biosphere is actually appearing out of the atmosphere. I mean, this is a miracle planet. <laughs> it's just mind blowing. That is the base of the General Sherman tree. Six million pounds, six million pounds of organic matter. So ozone, we know we've heard of ozone. Ozone is O3, three atoms of oxygen bound together. I'm sure the electron shells are full. We talked about electron shells. O2 is probably more, I think oxygen exists in the atmosphere as O2. So I didn't look into that. I'm not quite sure, you know, but we don't. I'm sure it doesn't matter to us. I'm just not quite sure why O3 forms in the way that it does. But ozone is O3, three atoms of oxygen together. It's our good fortune. It's probably, we could call it a Goldilocks effect that just either by chance, I don't know what the option is. I hate to say it, by design, O3 blocks some of the ultraviolet co light coming from the sun. Ultraviolet light is highly energetic and it's damaging to delicate organic tissue like the DNA in your cells. Or we know we have to, we have to be careful being out in the sun because the ozone layer does not block ultraviolet A a particular wavelength of ultraviolet light, it blocks ultraviolet B. So even still, there are hazards for us and we can get cataracts, we can get skin cancer from this high energy light. But the thing, a primary point is the ozone layer is produced by life. The oxygen in the atmosphere is all produced by life. Oxygen is highly reactive and would not exist in the atmosphere if photosynthesis was not constantly pumping it into the atmosphere because oxygen is so reactive. So it has it's life that has made the planet habitable for life. It's a very strange story. <laughs> These are banded iron formations. They call them BIFs, you know, an acronym for banded iron formation. They exist all over the planet. Science, science and scientists are so inquisitive and so clever that they have figured out the etiology, the origin of these rock formations. These are rock formations made out of iron. And what occurred here is that as oxygen started to build up in the atmosphere of the planet, long ago, 2.5 billion years ago. So there were no land plants, but photosynthesis had been initiated. And so the, cyto, the uh, cyanobacteria were photosynthesizing in the ocean, plankton, single-celled organisms, photosynthesizing in the ocean. Oxygen reached the level of 1% in the atmosphere. It's now 21%. The ocean was oxygenated. There was more oxygen, oxygen is reactive. O there was iron in solution, surprisingly, in the ocean and it reacted with the, with the oxygen, rusted, creating iron oxide, which is a solid and it precipitated out. It sank to the bottom of the ocean and created these bands of uh, uh, iron formations which are now the primary source of iron ore on the planet are these banded iron formations created by life, by life pumping oxygen first into the ocean, then into the atmosphere. Similar story is true for red rocks. Red rocks are rusty rocks, but this is, this is when the oxygen got somewhat higher in the, in the atmosphere. BIS might've been oxygen first in the oceans, oxygen in the atmosphere, I don't know at what level, not up 21%, but these is, this is rust. This is iron oxide that reacted, iron that reacted with oxygen in the soil 
and turn the rocks red. And it is a product of life. So life is a geologic force. <clears throat> so reproduction. I mean, it seems like a funny question at first, but there are life forms. Uh, I think the, I think the oldest bristlecone pine is five thousand years old. Well, that's that's a long time <clears throat> to live. And so the answer to the question, actually, it's I think it's a little bit surprising, and it really is that life is hazardous. <clears throat> life hangs on by a bit of a thumbnail to the planet and can only survive so long. There are so many contrary energies that any organism only lives so long and then is worn down by the erosive forces of the universe, cosmic radiation, uh, earthquakes, uh, <laughs> all of the adversity that you can think of wears down all life forms so that they eventually expire but in the process, they probably reproduced and created new life forms, which can then go through the cycle again. So I thought about taking this out. It's a little complicated, but it's, it's not that complicated. It's a little bit a short story on DNA. And so remember, we have we've heard we forget speaking for myself, but fortunately, it's printed out there. We have 23 pairs of matched chromosomes in all of our cells, actually, most of our cells. Not quite all of them, I think, is the case. <clears throat> one from our mother and one from our father. That's impressive right there. So they are slightly different. They carry the slight variations. They know how to match up. The 23 pairs know how to match up. But there are slight variations in the DNA from our mother and our father. When reproduction occurs in humans, these, let's see, what happens here? They, <clears throat> they both reproduce. So where there were two, now there's four. They, they separate into separate strands, chromosome DNA strands. And they've also engaged in a little hanky-panky here where I've got the cursor on the middle picture where some of one, the, a piece of one DNA has transferred over to the other DNA. It's called crossing over. And they actually exchange partial strands of DNA. I don't know how the world came up with that little trick, but it did so that here's a, here's a, a, strand of DNA and it's got a blue tip and this one has a red tip. So if these, this came from one matched pair of chromosomes and now there's four of them, if they were to recombine, I think the possibility is 88 million possible ways of recombining, but these are gonna recombine with a totally different set of DNA from a, from a sexual partner and the possible number of various recombinations of 64 trillion. So life is seeking, in sexual reproduction, life is seeking variability. And here is an example. This is a, an orchid. Orchids produce more than a million seeds in one flower. More than a million seeds in one flower. They're all re reproduced through sexual recombination. They all vary one from one another. How many of those seeds have to survive to adulthood to replace the parents? Two. So life reproduces uh, abundantly, to put it mildly. And then, and then the conditions on the planet at the time will select which or they can't all survive. If all million seeds from an orchid, one orchid flower survived, the world would have nothing but orchids, which you know doesn't sound like a bad thing, but there wouldn't be as much variety on the planet. Well, this is true for many, many organisms. They they create far more offspring than can survive, and that so it's true here for salmon. Salmon lay uh, chinook salmon lay about five thousand eggs. How many of those eggs have to survive to adulthood to replace the adults? Two. So all all else being equal, four thousand nine hundred ninety eight of those salmon will die before they reproduce, or the world will fill up with salmon. So life reproduces exuberantly, not all life. This is one way of reproducing this abundance, this massive abundance, but most offspring do not survive. It becomes a food source for other organisms. But there is this, every, every generation has all that, because of sexual recombination is variable. All 5,000 of those salmon eggs are different one from another. All million of those orchid eggs are different. So life drifts over time 
into variable organisms, which then over time can become new species, especially if they're separated from the progenitor, the, the parents. So this is a algae called chara. It's very common in the Medhow Valley. Looks like a plant, but it's not. If you take it out, it dies, and take it out of the water, it dies immediately. But it is uh, <clears throat> plant-like. And by the way, it's very scratchy. It's full of silica, it takes up a lot of silica. But this is in all of our lakes in the Medhow Valley. Um, and so an interesting thing is how much it looks like a, a horsetail, but it's not a, it's not a direct link. It's just, it is thought that chara may be the ancestor to land plants because the chemistry is so similar between this green algae chara and early green plants. Horsetails are not the earliest green plants. They're early, but not as early as mosses and liverworts. So what, what's, what's the, it's not the end product. It's not an end product, but it is a evolved product. You start out with plants, with land plants, colonizing, learning to colonize the wetlands where they don't have to worry about drying out. You have mosses and liverworts colonizing the wetlands on the land surface. And over time, over a period of 400 million years, because that's how long plants have been calling, you end up with redwood trees. This, this tree is almost 400 feet tall, the tallest organism on the planet. And it's just a variation over time, natural selection over time with a lot of time and an unimaginable amount of time for this process to take place. So I think this is the first time I've drawn this so there's a lot of information here and we can't digest it any of this material i can email to you if you ever want it but so the plant kingdom is divided up in divisions in the animal kingdom they call them phyla they tend to call them divisions in plants there are a number of them and this is a little out of date i put this together a long time ago and it's out of date because there's horse horse tail Sphenophyta, this is a scientific name, Sphenophyta has another scientific name if you want to, have been folded into ferns. Their horsetails are now considered ferns. It says over here, there are 40 species of ferns on the planet. It now would say 20 because of DNA analysis has shown species they thought were different to be the same. Things change over time and it's science trying to figure out, you know, the variety of life on the planet. But in general, this is accurate. It shows the different forms of plants on the planet. The only, you know, flower, there's only flower plants all the same group down here. They, this is also in sort of evolutionary history or progression. Flower plants are the most recently evolved. Uh, oh yeah. That was a little blank spot in my brain because grasses are flowering. Anyhow, look at look at the numbers. Here's the number of species. Uh, look at ginkgos. There's one ginkgo on the planet. There are 75 ephedra. There are 20 horsetails. Flowering plants, 300,000. Flowering plant plants are in a symbiotic relationship and look to animals to affect pollination, except for the wind pollinated plants, which also works fine. Um, so in terms of species variation they dominate the planet now in terms of biomass there is about i mean it would be roughly a similar weight of flowering plants and conifers even though there's only 630 species of conifers they dominate the high latitudes the land masses of the high latitudes if you think of the boreal, boreal forest north of us it extends from here all the way into Alaska, all the way through Canada. If you tried to weigh those trees, they would weigh as much as flower plants. Anyhow, it's the evolution. So something's happening over here. There's some kind of change where these X's peter out and these X's start to appear. And these are evolutionary adaptations to life on land, to life on dry land, where they can, they have a cuticle, that's a waxy sub surface on the outside of the plant surface. It can retain moisture, vascular system. It can move water up 
up the stem, early plants, even mosses don't have a vascular system. There's no X in here. Horse uh, liverworts, no vascular system. Pollen. Interestingly enough, over here, these mosses and even club mosses, they reproduce with a male gamete that swims with a tail. Sorry, I did that by itself. Which swims with a tail. What does that infer? There has to be water. So they evolve, life evolved. Life evolved in water, plants emerged from water. They emerged with a male gamete that swims with a tail that doesn't work very well on dry land. <laughs> so it disappeared and life, ev life e evolved ways to reproduce that are functional on dry land, pollen, notably pollen and uh, wind, w first wind pollinated and then going into symbiotic relationships with plants. So here's some of these organisms. I think that's supposed to be out of the way there. Uh, uh, so it, Chara is now considered to be a progenitor, an ancestor. It's a green algae, a green, an ancestor. <laughs> Somehow it crawled up on land. And like land. So this is just what some of these organisms look like. Here's a hornwort down here. I've never seen a hornwort. I think our chart, it said something like there's 100, 100, 100 on the whole planet. They're not very common. They may be in the methow, but bring me one if you ever find one. But we do have obviously large numbers of these other organisms. There's 26,000 mosses on the planet. And I think something like 200 species have been identified in the methow. Who would think there are that many mosses? Mosses are infinitely charming when you look at them or dissecting scope. This is what they look like in a dissecting scope. Look at this. These are up on top right here. I've got the cursor on the top right. These are these are sporophytes, reproductive structures of um, it's Polytricum uh, haircap moss. They call this hair. This is very common in the methow. Why do they call it haircap moss? Because the cap has hair. It wears a ski cap. It's just so charming. So you, you have to have a hand lens. But that may be enough said. So these are just characteristics of these plants. 26,000 mosses, 100 hornworts, 9,000 liverworts. This is numbers in the methow. Question mark for hornworts. Nobody's ever found one. We don't know. Stoneworts, that's that. Chara, nobody's probably ever paid any attention to it. Everything, all these things are just, this is a very common moss. All the dry rocks, it's called, uh, I call it. It's Grimia Montana. I guess, what do I call it? I forget. I mean, some of these mosses don't have common names and I just make them up. Rock moss, mountain moss. It's Grimia Montana. It's very common. Little tuft, little dark green, dry tuft most of the year, like down here, dry green. But this, but in the March, it reproduces and sends out these sporophytes. These sporophytes have their own profound intricacy, even though they're nearly microscopic. And part of the intricacy is the top is, is enclosed by teeth. These are folded inwards. So they seal together like, like the sepals of a flower. Computer has a mind of its own. Look at that. Maybe it's in a hurry because we're running out of time. Uh, the sporophytes have a lid. It's called an operculum. Here it is opened up. See it opened up there? It pops open. And the teeth then, according to the moisture in the atmosphere, fold in and out. When they fold in, they get spores on them. And when they fold out, the spores blow away. <laughs> so it's just that these, you know, these organisms have their own intricate life dynamics that we're largely unaware of, but makes a great study for anybody interested in natural history. So we're going through, I think maybe, let's see what comes up. This is the club mosses. This is at my house here outside. You can see I have great methouse soil on my property. Uh, this is the this is actually these so these rocks are all all smoothed off by water but there is no water on my property so why why is that well they're, it's the result of the last glaciation that 13,000 years ago i have all these glaciers they're, look, they're covered with lichens completely i never really thought about that completely covered with crustose lichens but this picture is to show a club moss this green thing <clears throat> the club moss so that's another plant division club mosses let's see how's this go Club mosses actually do have a vascular system. Up here, I have an X. That means they can conduct water. That means they can get some height. Well, this club moss doesn't get any height. It doesn't get any higher than an inch. 
But club mosses in history were up to 120 feet tall. I think actually 180 feet tall and two feet in diameter. And they make up a lot of the coal deposits around the world. So they were dominant plants 350 million years ago before conifers took over and forced them back down to more diminutive organisms. There are plenty, honey, let's see how many are there. 1,200 species of club mosses on the planet, eight in the Methow, but they don't get over a foot tall. There are some at Roger Lake that do grow up a foot tall, but that's it. But they used to grow 180 feet tall. Horsetails, a similar story, sorry. Horsetails used to be much bigger. They grew 100 feet tall and were a foot in diameter and they make up the rest of the coal deposits. These were horsetail trees that grew in wetlands, fell over in wet water, did not completely decompose. In fact, there may not have been the organisms capable of decomposing them when they were dominant on the planet 400 million years ago to 300 million years ago, they fell over into water and were, the organic matter was preserved. What did that preserve? It preserved the energy in the hydrocarbon bond that stored the energy of the sun. So now when you burn coal, it releases fossil sunshine. Ferns came up with a good idea and that is leaves. So those previous plants really didn't have leaves. If they did, they were just scale-like leaves in the case of club mosses. Ferns have leaves. Plant life is all about photosynthesis. So if you create a large flat surface, you have better photosynthetic ability. So ferns became dominant and there still are tree ferns on the planet. There are, tr there are ferns that grow 30 to 40 feet tall. So, an in but, but ferns reproduce with a flagellated male gamete. It has to swim to the female. So my homework assignment to you is to send me a report on how a fern that is 30 feet tall can reproduce with another fern that's 30 feet tall when the male has to swim to the female. <laughs> it just humors me to think about that. Well, that brings up conifers. See, the problem is if you reproduce with a gamete that has to swim to the female, you have to have liquid water at some point, a lot of liquid water in the, in the annual life cycle of that plant. If, if plants could free themselves from the necessity for standing water or liquid water, then they could colonize the uplands of the continents. And I don't know if you remember from the geology presentation, but continents have been in, increasing in quantity over time. There was not very much continental land early in the history of the planet. So the continents is becoming more and more land mass, but the plants can't colonize them. It's too dry. Over time, <clears throat> wind pollination evolved in conifers. We know that, but we're just reiterating the point. And so there, that liberated them to colonize the uplands of the planet. And what dominates the uplands of the planet? Conifers it, at the high and low latitudes and flowering plants at the mid latitudes. So this is a male cone. These are male cones in the upper left. They're gonna produce copious quantities of pollen because wind pollination is totally by chance. It's just cast to the wind. I would say there's certainly no more than one in a million pollen grains reaches its intended product, uh, uh, intended target, which is a female cone, a receptive female cone on another plant so that you're cross, cross pollinating. So this is a female cone, obviously, and there is a, this year's cone up here, hopefully you can see the cursor, but in any case, I can pull up. This is, this is what a cone looks like early in the year. If you look in March and April and May, you can find these early female cones. They take two years to, to ripen, but this then would be a ripe female cone waiting for pollen from male cones. This is a picture I took at home some years ago, April 2011. All the pollen in the ponderosa pine releases on the same day. They're in communication. Somehow those trees are communicating with one another. They're optimizing the, the potential of that pollen to reach female cones. Actually, it would be interesting to think about that. It seems like it would be advantageous for one cone to one tree to pollinate the day before all the other <laughs> anyhow, and uh, dominate the reproductive success. Anyhow, this is pollen. 
massive quantities of pollen are released. I saw a picture, I think my neighbor, Scott, who lives up on the hill took it. He can see out over the valley and the whole valley was covered with pollen a year or two ago in May. Uh, this is June, June 6th. So this is pollen on Crater Lake. It's all wasted, just massive, right? Like I said, one, the best you could hope for is one grain in a million would by chance reach a female cone. So it's functional. It liberates plants to colonize the uplands, but it's very wasteful. Is there a better method? Animal species followed plants onto the dry land. Why? Because plants create food. Now there's something to eat. The first, the first animals that came onto land ate those plants, but over time they created a symbiotic relationship. So these are army worms, probably a moth, caterpillar, devouring that apple leaf. So they're predatory on the apple leaf. And that's just an example of early life preying on plant on autotrophs, organisms that can create food. But over time, symbiotic relationships arose. So there are, these are flowering plants, alders, flowering plant, birch, cottonwoods, they're flowering plants, but they're still wind pollinated. And it's an interesting aspect of evolution. Many things work. There's not a best way to do things. So insect pollination is great, but there are still many other ways to pollinate. So there are many flowering plants, including as I mentioned, the grass family, which is one of the largest families and the mo probably the most widespread flowering plant family on the planet, it's wind pollinated. Wind pollination still works. There's no one best way, which I try to talk to myself about, about homo sapiens. There is no single best way to be on the planet, but it's hard to get that to sink into my thick brain. So these, this is alder. These are male catkins. These are male catkins on the birch. These are male catkins on the cottonwood. The females in there somewhere. They're not quite as showy, especially hard to find on alder. They create little cones on birch. And I think they're female catkins on cottonwoods. They fall to the ground. You can find them in May. So, and then the evolutionary journey, I think, is somewhat illustrated. They have these wind pollinated flowering plants. This is willow. It has a wind pollination format um, with catkins here. Very beautiful, by the way. So, uh, great fun to pay attention to. So, it's going to cast pollen to the wind, but they're, they also produce a tiny bit of nectar at the base of each little floret so that they attract insects. So, all things being equal, willows are. 50% wind pollinated and 50% insect pollinated. And I don't know if you noticed, these are the first plants to produce nectar in the spring. I would say end of March, early April. And they sound like they're alive. There are insects all over the willow trees in the methow in the spring. It's a great harbinger of things to come. So this is sort of a success in terms of diversity over time. Ferns, these are ferns, these are millions of years ago. So here's at the far left, 400 million years ago, 300, 200 over time. So ferns were early evolved. They appeared one of the early land plants 400 million years ago. There were more ferns, there were bigger ferns and they have, there's still a lot of ferns. In fact, I forget the number, it's either, I think, at least 12,000 ferns on the planet. Uh, but they're, they tend to be uh, limited to wet habitats, moist places. Conifers were liberated from that because of wind pollination and other, other and it's cuticle, wood, woody structure that was able to retain moisture. So they colonized the uplands. They appeared 375 million years ago. There aren't, they really, <clears throat> even though flowering plants have, in, a, in terms of species diversity have taken over the planet, they have not in terms of biomass. As I said before, conifers roughly, in terms of biomass, equal flowering plants. Many things work. There are many ways to be on the planet. Maybe reiterating here that th this X's show this change over time. They gave up the sperm that lives with a the tail. There was no cuticle. There was no vascular system. All these capacities for living on drier land have evolved over time and lignin for overtopping other plants. If you have wood and a vascular system, you can grow tall. So if you can overtop over plants for a while, you have an advantage because you dominate the solar gain. 
Um, and so they, the story with a story with grass is that film I showed at the program on Wednesday, it was called the challenger. It's about the grass family. What's it challenging? It's challenging. The grass is challenging the dominance of trees. Why? Because it's so flammable. Grass, grass has co-evolved with fire and it, it, in, it, um, enlists fire to burn down the forest. <laughs> that fire that, let's see, Carlton Complex fire. I meant to look it up. I forget when it was. When was it? 2006, whenever it was. It burned from, it burned from Cougar Lake, Perigen Lake, all the way to, to Terrace. It burned 50 miles and it burned, it burned in two days. What did it burn through? Grass. It was burning at miles an hour. I forget the speed, something like four miles an hour. You could, no way you could outrun it. Um, grass is quite with fire. So just briefly on flowers, they have different strata. Flowers are co-evolved with their pollinators if they're showy, if not so if they're wind pollinated. <clears throat> so they, each flower has a strategy. And so an interesting thing is to first know that every flower you see has a strategy for pollination and then wonder what is the strategy of that flower? Well, flowers that are radial, round like a wheel, are open for one thing, an open landing platform, open to any pollinator. They're considered to be pollination generalists. Any insect in particular that wanted to try to, uh, to access the nectar offered by this flower could do so, could land on it easily, probably at the base of the petal. While it's sticking its tongue at the base of the petal, the, the anthers are sticking out there and it's gonna dust it with pollen. But they're pollination generalists, so you attract pollinators things like flies that are not very trustworthy. There's no telling that a fly will go to the same, another flower of the same species and deliver the pollen. <clears throat> Flowers that are bilateral tend to be pollination specialists. This is Calypso orchid, actually not uncommon in the Methow in May, in, in the forest, it's probably in a mycorrhizal, I'm sure it is. All orchids are in mycorrhizal relationships with fungi. Those fungi, in this case, are probably also in relationship with conifers because you always find this under conifers. It's a pollination specialist. Only bumblebees pollinate this flower uh, because it's hard to read the re reproductive structures. They're hidden away under that hood. And it is a deception pollinator. It, it emits a, a, a fragrance, which is very attractive to bumblebees, but it, it offers no nectar. And the pollen is stuck on the head of the insect and it can't reach it. So it's not a food source. It's a deception pollinator. Everything goes, everything goes in the natural world. They so very, there's 300,000 species. They're all different. They all have their own strategy and you get to wonder about every one of them. This is a buttercup up here in the upper left. If you pull a petal off, you can actually see the nectary with your bare eye at the base of the petal. Well, there's a nectary at the base of every petal. The insect, it's, it's a pollination generalist. Insect lands, sticks its tongue in there. The anthers hit the, the anthers hit the hairy head of the insect. Columbine, Columbine's different. Nothing. Columbine, the nectary is at the end of this uh, bract, way back here. Nothing's going to reach that nectar that doesn't have a tongue that's, you know, an inch long. <laughs> But, but the reproductive structures are in the center, sticks its head in there, its tongue, pollen is delivered, but it's, 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 it's more of a pollination specialist. <clears throat> Long tongue, what's it gonna be? The red ones are pollinated by hummingbirds. <clears throat> and the other ones have their own strategies. This is monk's hood down here and the nectary is inside the hood. You can't get in. I'll leave you to wonder how that works because we're running out of time. But the, the, the pollinators vary too, including the insects have different length tongues. Flies have short tongues. Bees have medium length tongues. What's medium length? Uh, half an inch. And the Lepidopterans have incredibly long tongues, including the Lepidopteran that, stop it, that pollinates this orchid. So this is an orchid in Madagascar that was sent to Darwin in 1852, something like that. 
<clears throat> and it has a nectary that is, this is a nectary. To say here, <clears throat> I think it's 15 inches long. And so it was sent to Darwin and nobody could understand why it, this would be this way. And Darwin hypothesized there has to be an insect with a proboscis 15 inches long. And it wasn't found until after he died, 1903. And then this moth, which is down here, has this proboscis, which you can barely see. And I tried to put in a red line. Let's see if it comes up. No, yeah. Well, it's not as wiggly as I made it, but there's this red line. It parallels this proboscis here. So these, the flower and the moth have clearly co-evolved. There is no other organism on the planet that is going to pollinate that flower. If that moth goes extinct, the orchid will go extinct, probably vice versa. <clears throat> There's advantages to that tight coupling that we don't have time to even ponder. So a few of our flowers, this is sagebrush buttercup. It'll be out mm, not for a while. <laughs> we have found sagebrush buttercups like on Bucky Hill about February 20th, but not this year. You can't have three feet of snow on the ground and find sagebrush buttercups. But it's a pop so this is a pollination generalist. If you if you flower early in the spring, you have to be a, a pollination generalist. Pollination, yeah, because there's no insects. There's so few insects that you have to appeal to any passing insect. So these have nectaries, as I mentioned, at the base of the petal right here. Insect sticks its head in here. These are anthers. They deliver pollen to the insect, and the insect gets its reward of nectar and goes to another buttercup because that's all there is. And the end of March, a buttercup. So the only flower there is. <clears throat> this is Chelan penstemon. You know, it's called Chelan penstemon because it's not very widespread. It's not a common plant around the Pacific Northwest. It's indigenous to our area. We have plenty of it in the Methow. It grows on very dry, rocky ground, but it has co-evolved with bumblebees. And the flower is shaped like the reverse image of a bumblebee so that the head fits perfectly into the flower and the bee with its medium length tongue is able to access the nectar. An interesting mystery, this is another of your homework assignments. The word, these are penstemons, there are many penstemons, they're great flowers, it means five stamens. Penstemons have four stamens. So your homework assignment is to figure out why. You can read through all the naturalists and find it in the natural somewhere. There was a story years ago about that monkshood. I mentioned monkshood, very beautiful flower, an odd flower. It must be a pollination specialist because it's bilateral. Its trick is it, the nectary is up in the top of the hood. The reproductive structures are down here, but the access to get into the nectary, to get to the nectary and get the nectar is over the top of the reproductive structures. So bumblebees force their way in there. They push that open and get in there, only bumblebees. Bumblebees will also cut a hole in the side of the hood. And so they cheat. So nature cheats. Well, uh, you know, what everything goes. Briefly on leaves. We don't think much about leaves, but the first land plants had no leaves. Leaves are both an advantage and a disadvantage because plants have to retain their moisture <clears throat> and leaves are gonna constantly transpire moisture to the environment. And so there were no leaves, but they turned out to be more of an advantage than a disadvantage and evolved over time. And every plant has its own leaf shape. These are compound leaves on, on milk vetch astragalus. I think we have just a little bit of the species in the madhouse, no barriers, you know, not compound individual leaves. So I, this is a chart of advantages and disadvantages, advantages, advantages. I block part of it out. But what's the advantage of large leaves? So now we can, you know, focus on what's here. Well, it's increased photosynthesis. It's an increased solar panel. You get a lot more solar gain. That's the whole point of the leaf is to photosynthesize. But a large leaf will reduce air movement due to friction. You get less air moving over the leaf. Why do you want air moving over the leaf? Because carbon dioxide only exists in the atmosphere at 420 parts per million. And you're trying to make the general Sherman tree out of a gas that exists in the atmosphere of 400 parts per million. So you want air movement. Small leaves, what's the advantage of a small leaf? It increases air movement and therefore transport of CO2. Disadvantage, a decreased surface area for photosynthesis. So I can send you this if you want. It's just that we don't think about this, but all those different leaf shapes 
all have advantages and disadvantages to productivity. These are stomata in the leaves. They have increased. I don't know. I don't, I think it's increased. There were no stomata the early. So these are pores that open and close. The plant can seal these shut so that it doesn't lose valuable water, moisture in the, or it can open them to take in atmospheric gases, including carbon dioxide. So it's able, the plant is able to control them. Early plants had no stomata. I don't know quite how that worked. I guess they just had pores, but they couldn't control their pores. The number of stomata in, in leaf surfaces has increased dramatically as carbon dioxide has decreased in the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide used to be 5,000 parts per million, 4,000, 3,000, 2,000, 1,000. There is another side to that story. I don't dwell on it. People don't like to hear it, but every story has two sides. The number of stomata on the leaves, it's up to something like, I have it written down, it's something like two or 300 stomata per square millimeter. Just, oh, these are microscopic. It's like plants. I put in here this quote. This paleobotanist says, are modern plants gasping for air? <laughs> They're made out of carbon dioxide. They have to have it. So our plants, all, every plant in the Mahout is adapted to its environment. One of the notable ones is bitterroot. How is it adapted? How is it going to live on these rocky outcrops where there is no moisture except in the fall and the spring? Well, the answer to that is the, the leaves of the, of the bitterroot appear in the fall. You can find it has weird fleshy leaves. These are they. They appear in the fall. Early, I'd say early, all through October. They photosynthesize, they're capturing the energy of the sun, they're pumping that energy into starch in the in the roots. The plant then does not dry up. It's there under the snow. The snow melts, the leaves are already preformed in the fall. It begins photosynthesizing as the snow melts on March 1st. And Mar in the middle of March, a bud appears in the middle of the plant. The leaves dry up, and when the and when the plant flowers, the leaves are gone. If you look at bitter, you cannot find any leaves. It's just like somebody threw flowers out of an airplane. In early May, these, these, they're able to bloom because the food was stored in the fall and the spring when it's wet in the met house, and then the whole plant disappears. And by June 1st, you cannot find any sign of bitter root. So they're totally adapted. Look at their environment. They grow on this rocky shale outcrops in the met house. So every, uh, this is another example of adaptation I thought was fascinating, cottonwoods. So cottonwoods are named after their cotton that they produce in May. The air is full of cotton in May. Well, what else happens? Cotton, cottonwood seeds are tiny. They have no endosperm, which means they cannot survive very long after they germinate. They have to germinate in soil that is supportive of the seed. Otherwise they'll just die. And so when do they, when are they spread, send out into the land to try and reproduce? In May. What else happens in May? The river floods in the middle of May and, and or early May and then drops and leaves this wet mud on the edges of the river. And that's what the cottonwoods have evolved to land on. And then they germinate in that uh, positive environment. If, and most of them die, most of them die. So this is the end. So what these are some emergent qualities of plants. It, and I mentioned emergence is, is uh, the first characteristic of big history that we live in an emergent universe, especially an emergent planet. And I think if, you know, for me to digress briefly and momentarily, if you're looking for hope for the human situation, it's an emergent universe and everything changes over time and human potential is off the charts. It just hasn't emerged. <laughs> Plants are the primary source of biomass on the planet, mostly trees. We don't think of it that way, but that's the way it is. Plants have changed the chemistry of the atmosphere. There was no oxygen, there was no nitrogen. The atmosphere is now 78% nitrogen put there by nitrogen fixing bacteria, 21% oxygen put there by plants. Plants are a geologic force. We think plants grow on the earth, but plants have changed the, the texture of this crust of the earth. Plants make terrestrial life, animal life possible. There would be no animals without plants. Animals cannot create their own food. Plants can. There's a thousand times more plant life than animal life. Plants are the source of fossil fuels. They're fossil plants that captured the end of the sun and were sequestered in uh, 
geologic strata, humans co-evolved with trees. Primates evolved in the trees. And we spent 80 million years in trees before we came down and walked around on the land. And the use of fire for cooking food, well, what do we use for fuel? It's plants. Made the energy and nutrients available. You know, for brother, the pain is doing this with it. The human brain consumes 20% of the energy of the body. It's a very energy intensive organ and it only really was able to expand because of this uh, evolutionary use of fire, which is burning plants. So these are pollen grains. And it's a nice example of the beauty of life on all scales. You'll get all set up for 50 bucks. Yes. Oh. I like... Uh, Chardon's yeah. reflection. The purpose of evolution is ever more yeah. perfect eyes in a world in which there's ever more to see. Somebody's prematurely unmuted. So, how are we going to get ready for an adventure on this planet? Throw some bread and tea. This is John Muir. All I need to do to get ready for an adventure is throw some bread and tea in an old sack and jump over the back fence. <laughs> yep. That's great. Oh, mm -hmm. I. Did everything? I'm trying to uh, mute Lois, I but the bulbs on all the different stuff. Stuff. So I don't know what's going on there. So Every time I mute, well, I didn't lose everybody. And there's two different colors and whatever, but it's something. Yeah, it's something. Yeah, sort of that I don't. I'm muting her, and she just as soon as I mute her, she comes back. Huh? Yeah. I wish uh, I could just. Good effort. Yeah, my You're pleasure. Getting... There's a, a few chats in there. Sorry about that. Go ahead. Uh... Okay, I'm going to stop the.